NASCAR is a team sport like many other professional sporting leagues around the world. Teams in NASCAR are unique in that they sometimes have multiple teams under their umbrella competing against each other. Imagine if the Yankees fielded two MLB teams, or the Packers had two NFL teams. In the sport's 76 year history, we have seen many teams come and go. Some are new to the scene, and others have been around for over 70 years. Hi, I'm your host Matt, and this is NASCAR Team History, presented by Dogleg Media. In this series, we look to tell the stories of the different teams in our sport's history. We will explore a wide range of topics in respect to the team's history, when they entered NASCAR, their drivers, numbers, and overall legacy. We will also include memorable moments from you, the viewer. Today we explore one of the biggest what-ifs and heartbreaks in the sport's history, Dell Earnhardt Incorporated. But with that intro out of the way, let's dive into some more NASCAR team history. We start this video off with the beginnings of DEI. Many of us know them for their Budweiser 8 car that debuted in 1999, but the team would first hit the track 15 years prior to their heyday. DEI, also known as Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, was started by Kannapolis native and legend of the sport Dale Earnhardt. He would first hit the track as a team owner in 1984. The staple number 8 would be the number to start it all, in the heart of NASCAR, Charlotte. Earnhardt would bring home an impressive 4th place finish in the team's debut, and it wouldn't take the team long to find victory lane. Dale would bring his team its first trophy in 1985 at Rockingham just five races into their existence. For the first 11 seasons, the team would run part-time, picking up 17 wins, all with Earnhardt during that stretch. The team's first full season would come in 1995, with Jeff Green behind the wheel in the Xfinity Series and Ron Hornaday in the newly formed Truck Series. Green would have two full-time seasons with the team, in 1995 and 1996 while Hornaday would spend five seasons with the team from 95 to 99. Hornaday would be extremely successful in this time, winning the team their first NASCAR championship in 1996 and becoming the first winner in the team's history without the Earnhardt last name. That season would also see the first start by Dale Earnhardt Jr., but more on him in a bit. Trust me, a lot more. And the significance of 1996 doesn't end there, as it would be the team's first foray into the Cup Series, with Jeff Green making the team's first Cup Series start at Pocono. The team would shift their focus to Steve Park for the 1997 Xfinity Series season. Park would win three times that season, while Hornaday would add another five wins to his total, and Park would come home third in the standings and Hornaday fifth. And alright y'all, as we enter the 1998 season, we begin the June Bug era. The heir to the Earnhardt throne, Dale Jr. would make his first full-time Xfinity season and what a season it would be. He would win seven times en route to the championship. Ron Hornaday would also win the truck championship that season, showing the potential of the team. DEI would also put together their first full-time effort in the Cup Series in 1998, mainly split between Steve Park and legend Darrell Waltrip in the one car. Junior would go on to win the Xfinity Series title in 1999 as well, and would make his first starts in the legendary number 8 Budweiser car. This is where we conclude the beginnings of the team, and go into the detailed Cup Series history of Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. We start off the detailed Cup Series history of DEI with their first full-time number, the 1. Before we jump in too deep, let's look at the stats of the 1 car at DEI. The one car with the team had three total wins with two different drivers. And also, now is a great time to mention that I will only be covering DEI as a team until 2008. The merger with Ganassi in 2009 that ran until 2013 is not going to be covered in this video. Luckily, Ganassi is the next team to be featured, and that is where we will dive into that weird and wild situation. Also, Ganassi said that Voldemort was never involved in the team so I will take his word for it and give the credit of Montoya and McMurray's wins to Chip. With that bit of clarification out of the way, we get back to the one. We mentioned previously that the one car would debut in 1998. They would technically attempt to run the full season, but failed to qualify in three events. Steve Park, Phil Parsons, and Ron Hornaday would be the drivers to DNQ that season. We also discussed that Steve Park and Darrell Waltrip would be the heavy lifters that season. In 1999, Earnhardt would promote Park to the full-time driver of the One. Park would spend five years as the driver of the One. He would collect both of his career wins with the team as well, 
His first coming in 2000 at Watkins Glen. His last career win was an emotional one to say the least. He would win at Rockingham, the week after team owner Dale Earnhardt would lose his life at the 2001 Daytona 500. He would win in a photo finish ahead of Bobby Labonte and would then display an Earnhardt number no. 3 hat to the crowd paying homage to his late boss. Park would be injured in an Xfinity Series race at Darlington and Kenny Wallace would fill in while Park recovered. Park would miss 16 races and would come back 5 races into the 2002 season. However, Park wasn't the same after returning, finishing 30th in the standings and failing to post a single top 5. He would be relieved of his driving duties midway through 2003 in favor of Jeff Green in an essential driver swap with Park taking Green's ride at RCR. The rest of 2003 was a weird one for the one car, as three other drivers would have seat time in it, with Canadian Ron Fellows running the road courses. John Andretti would run 10 of the final 11 races of the season, with Jason Keller running the fall Talladega race. 2004 and 2005 would be part-time seasons for the one, with a slew of different drivers. We would see the first glimpses of Xfinity Series star Martin Truex Jr. in 2004 and 2005, with Truex making nine starts over those next two seasons. Oh, and Ron Fellows would come oh so close to winning at Watkins Glen in 2004. He would start dead last after qualifying was canceled, but would drive his way through the field to finish second. 2006 would see the return of the one full time with their star young talent Truex. He would struggle early into his rookie season, but would finish the year off with an impressive runner up finish at Homestead. Truex would break the drought in 2007 though, grabbing his first career win and DEI's last at Dover that season. In DEI's final season as a team in 2008, Truex would go winless, with two top fives finishing 15th in the standings. And that's the history of the number one at DEI. Now let's move to a fan favorite. That's right, it's everyone's favorite winning DEI number, the 01. Bad joke, I know but the 2008 Amp Energy 500 fiasco should never be forgotten. Yeah, these stats aren't very impressive, but they at least got a win. Let's look at its very brief history. The 01 has one win with one driver. And sure, it's not NASCAR official, but hey, it happened. And when I say a brief history, I mean a very brief history. It's been only two years with the team, in 2007 and 2008. This short stint, however, did produce some massive moments with the team. To start, the O1 would come to the team after Gen Racing would merge with DEI. The O1 had a driver lineup already set in stone before the merger, and those drivers would be a part of the DEI lineup for 2007. In the numbers debut with the team, Mark Martin would be leading, exiting turn 4 in the Daytona 500, and was set to make a ton of NASCAR fans happy. Well, Happy Harvick the Closer would have other plans and he charged to the lead with only a few hundred feet to spare, ending in a photo finish. I love Harvick, but man, I really wanted to see Mark win that race. Myself, along with a large number of NASCAR fans, remember this moment, but something I don't remember is how hot of a start Mark would actually have in the ride. He would record three straight top fives to start the season. In 25 races with the L1 that season, Mark would record an impressive five top fives and six additional top tens. Had he ran the full season, he would have more than likely made the chase. Regan Smith and Eric Almirola would split the remainder of the schedule, but had less than ideal stats, failing to post a single top 20 effort. In 2008, Regan Smith would be the primary driver of the 01, making all but two starts with it. Ron Fellows would fill in on the road courses, but he didn't have much luck. Regan would have an abysmal season, finishing outside the top 20 in 30 of his 34 races. He would, however, break through at Talladega in the fall to grab the numbers only win for DEI. Yep, the 2008 Amp Energy 500 trophy rightfully belongs to Regan Smith, and I am officially petitioning Tony Stewart to give the trophy to him. NASCAR committed highway robbery in that race, so in the official record book, Regan never won with the 01. However, we here at Dogleg Media know the truth. Justice for Regan. And yeah. That's the end of the 01 story with the team. I told you it would be quick. On to the penultimate number for DEI. And all right, we've made it to the 15, and this one is somehow the second winningest number in DEI Cup Series history. Man, it kind of tells you that DEI was a one-man show, but we'll get to that one man shortly. 
Let's get into the 15. The 15 has four total wins with one different winner. And yeah, all four of those wins belong to the first of two drivers for the 15, Michael Waltrip. The 15 would start its time with the team in the most bittersweet moment in NASCAR history. Michael Waltrip, being on a 462 race winless drought spanning all the way back to 1985, would finally visit Victory Lane. He would win the sport's biggest race, the Daytona 500, to start the season. Waltrip's celebration would be short-lived, however, as he would receive the news that his team owner and friend would tragically pass away at the end of the race. My heart still hurts for Mikey. Waiting 16 years to find Victory Lane and what should have been the happiest day of his life would quickly become the worst. Michael would persevere, however, and would find Victory Lane three more times in his time with the team. Waltrip would spend five seasons with DEI, from 2001 until 2005. All four of his wins would come at super speedways, including a second Daytona 500 trophy in 2003. He would leave the team at the conclusion of the 2005 season to join Bill Davis Racing for one year before bringing his team to the Cup Series in 2007. With Waltrip gone, the team would run the 15 on a part-time basis with Paul Menard in 2006. Menard would attempt to qualify for 10 races that season, but failed to qualify three times. 2007 would see DEI attempt to run the full schedule with Menard behind the wheel, but again would fail to qualify for some races, this time failing six times. They would also fail to post a single top 10 that season, finishing 34th in the standings. In the team's final season of 2008, Menard would manage to run the entire season, but only posted one top five and no top 10s. That one top five is the topic of controversy as well. Some cynical people out there claim that Paul Menard is the righteous winner of the 2008 Amp Energy 500, and man, those people couldn't be more wrong. If you are one of those people, I encourage you to put your argument down below. I could really use a good laugh. The 15's history is also a short one, with only two drivers in its time with the team. But what do you expect from a team that spent less than a decade of full-time cup racing? And all right, I've kept everyone waiting long enough. Yep, this is the big one, driven by arguably the most popular driver in NASCAR history. And I'm not talking about Eric Almirola. Let's wrap this one up with the eight. The eight has 17 total wins with one driver. And much like the 15, all of its wins belongs to the first to drive it. Dale Earnhardt Jr. would begin piloting the famous Budweiser eight car in 1999. He would grab his first win at Texas in 2000. And man, it's still awesome to see him celebrate with his dad in victory lane. We fans would get to see that celebration three times with Junior winning two points races and that season's all-star race as well. In my opinion, Junior's most memorable moment would come in 2001 at Daytona in the summer, just months after his father would lose his life at the track. Dale would use lessons learned from his father to go from sixth to first and score the victory at the Pepsi 400 that summer. The celebration that ensued between he and teammate Michael Waltrip will forever be one of the best moments in the sport's history. 2001 would also be the beginning of a four straight Talladega win streak. This streak would span from 2001 until 2003, showing just how good June Bug was at the Alabama Super Speedway. 2003 would also see Junior's best points finish with the team, finishing third in the standings. 2004 would be Junior's most dominant season, winning six times and making a deep run in the chase. However, two straight DNFs would kill his hopes of winning the title. And we would also see the iconic, it's Bristol baby, moment this season and it is now a trademarked phrase. That's pretty wild. 2005 would be Junior's worst season in terms of points finish, coming home 19th in the final standings. He would grab a lone win that season at Chicagoland, but not much more. 2006 would be a quiet year for Junior. He would grab one win at Richmond, but consistent all season long. He would come home fifth in the final standings. And then we reach 2007, and this is when the beginning of the end really took place. Junior was unsatisfied with the direction the team was headed under she who should not be named. He stated that if he didn't gain majority ownership of the team, that he wasn't confident in the team's ability to field elite level equipment. Junior would go winless for the first time in his full-time career and would announce that he would be leaving his father's once great team to join Hendrick Motorsports at season's end. This final chapter in the eight's history with DEI is just a strange one. Using the same number font that was so closely connected with Junior, 
the team would split seat time with Mark Martin and Eric Almarola. Mark would put together some respectable runs, netting four top fives in his time with it. Almarola would post one top ten, and the team would finish an honestly surprising 14th in the owner's points that season. And that's it for the history of DEI's time in the Cup Series. Well, except for that one-off race that John Andretti made at the 2003 Brickyard 400 in the 81 car. Yep, it finished dead last, and was never seen again. Now let's move to some honorable mentions from you, the viewers. Silver Thunder mentioned Kerry Earnhardt's lone Xfinity Series start for the team in 2008. Yeah, it would take until DEI's final season for Kerry to make a start for his late father's team in one of NASCAR's top three series. He would finish 17th in a number eight car that looked very similar to his little brother's scheme. Great mention. And let's keep on the Kerry Earnhardt train. Miguel mentioned his win in the ARCA series being the last for the team in that series. He would win in a number two car at Atlanta in 2001, and that would be the team's last ARCA win. This is also a great mention. John Vandeventer mentioned Dell Jr.'s win after the 9-11 attacks at Dover. This was a massive win not only for the sport, but for the country. This was at the peak of NASCAR's heyday, and let me tell you, this one had fans and the country excited. Dale would fly the American flag during his burnout and victory lap, and an Earnhardt victory after that tragedy was a great pick-me-up. And of course I didn't mention it above to put it in honorable mentions, but Tony Meows and Titan mentioned Dale Jr. winning the 2004 Daytona 500. This was massive. The trophy that eluded his father for 20 years would belong to an Earnhardt again. And much like the 2001 Pepsi 400 celebration, this Daytona 500 celebration was one for the ages. Great mention and moment. And that'll do it for the history of Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. This is the first team we have discussed that is no longer around. Man, what could have been of this team had the Intimidator not left us that February day in 2001? As always, I'm prone to forgetting drivers and moments. Let me know anything I may have missed for DEI down below. Next time, we look at another team that is no longer in the Cup Series, Chip Ganassi Racing. Be sure to let me know your honorable mentions for that one down below. If you liked the video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing. It helps a ton and I definitely appreciate it. And did you know that 77% of my viewers aren't subscribed, but they are returning viewers? If you keep coming back, but you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, what are you waiting for? As always, I want to thank the Dogleg team for all of their incredible work. Darksy, Dice, Nino, Elite, Jafer, and The Gamer, y'all make the channel and community a great place. We also have a Discord server. Find the invite in the About section of the channel or in the description below. We have over 220 members and we share our silly season picks, merch collections, race reaction, exclusive contests, and so much more over there. Come join us. We'd love to have you. But that'll do it for us here at Dogleg Media. I'm Matt, your host, and you've been watching NASCAR Team History. I'll see you next time.